to all my uh, co-panelists here. What a great group. Uh, we have a lot of really interesting participants as well. I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about information control, which I think is a very key element to why I agree that people want peace and they want life, yet our government, at least the US government, goes right on spending, spending, spending our treasure on death dealing. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. I'm wearing this colorful t-shirt, which you can order from the Global Network, Free the Sky of Nukes and Weapons. And I'm gonna start sharing my uh, slides now. So thanks for bearing with me here. Okay. The first slide that I would like to um, share with you is uh, called Pentagon Planet. Uh, this was created by a professional illustrator named Anthony Frieda for my use because I have been focusing on the carbon impact, the greenhouse gas emissions, and the uh, climate impact of the Pentagon for a while now. Um, the power of a really good image is, of course, uh, far beyond words. I'm kind of a words person myself, but I do very much like working with creative people and um, getting them to help us get this message out in as many ways as possible. Um, as we know, propaganda mostly works not by putting forth false facts, but more by creating a very small peephole that we are to look at the world through and having a sort of managed narrative visible through that tiny little peephole and giving us either directly or indirectly the message, everything outside that peephole, ignore it. It doesn't matter. It's not real. It's not valid. Pay no attention to it. I think that this uh, has been used very, very effectively by in the US, certainly. And um, you know, I mean, just at the most basic level, you, we have naming. So after World War II, all the war departments became the Department of Defense. Um, I have a quote from a Defense Department spokesman, John Kirby, who told the military publication Defense, uh, one that um, no one would come from the Pentagon would come to COP26, but he said that Pentagon officials remain hard at work building climate resilience through the department and the force. So I translate these sort of weasel words as we hope to survive the fire that we continue to pour fuel on. But I'm sad to say that probably most of uh, the people in the US do not really you know, uh, deconstruct these statements and they kind of take it at face value um, that the Pentagon is working hard on climate. Um, one of the, uh, sorry, one of the things that is a little bit trickier here is the climate impacts of militarized space operations. So I've been focusing on the Pentagon for a while. As we know, the last president uh, created Space Force and the current president kept it. Um, I have uh, really asked myself in preparing this presentation, the questions, who knows about the climate impacts of militarized space and who cares about them? And why is there so much silence around what you would think is a very critical issue as we you know, head uh, toward a tipping point that we can't get back from. There is a research group I found um, uh, headed by Dr. Eunice Murray at the University College of London. Um, and I'll be showing some of their uh, findings in a minute. But who among the general public really knows about the research of academics without journalists or other interested parties reporting it for us? So, if the, general, if the general public can be kind of kept in the dark that a problem even exists, that is the fact that militarized space operations have a terrible climate impact, most people simply won't know enough about it uh, to care. I wanted to share a graphic that was created by the Cost of War Project at uh, the Watson Institute at Brown University. Uh, this was created to display the findings of Dr. Nita Crawford's research into the emissions of the global war on terror. So in 2019, Dr. Crawford reported out on what she had found. I've, I've been lucky enough to hear her speak. And I know that she said it was also extremely difficult to find data about this. Um, so she went at it from the angle of, uh, you know, fuel consumed, because that was something that she could find data on. The kind of jets that the military uses often emit um, worse greenhouse gas you know, uh, effect than a regular commercial jet. I really liked how 
uh, some professional infographic creators were employed here, and also how they scaled it to something that most people looking at it do have experience with, and that is uh, driving their car. And so um, I'm really hopeful that we will see more of this kind of um, helpful information, uh, infographics and, and uh, other graphics, so that we can really combat this whole uh, strategy of communication strategy, which is to say, oh, uh, the Pentagon is, this, is offering solutions to climate crisis, or NASA, as you'll see in a couple slides, is offering solutions to climate crisis, um, very much sidestepping the fact that, well, yes, they're part of a huge part of creating the problem as well. This is a visual that was um, produced by the uh, research group I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Eloise Murray and Dr. Robert Ryan of University of College of London collaborated with Seb Eastham of MIT's Department of Aeronautics and Chloe Balhatchet, I hope I'm saying that right, Balhatchet of the University of Cambridge. And they titled uh, the page where I found this graphic, Impact of Rocket Launches and Space Debris on the atmosphere and climate. There's a lot of space debris up there and falling into the atmosphere and burning up and that also you know, has its climate impact. Uh, their explanation was the space sector is growing rapidly without environmental regulation. Here we have constructed an inventory of emissions from rocket launches and the burn up of returning space junk to determine the impact of current and future emissions on climate and the composition of the upper atmosphere. Um, this shows the launches in 2019 by nation. It also uh, gives the total weight of those launches and um, breaks down the fuel types used because uh, that often has a big climate impact. Um, one of the ways that uh, we find out about things in this day and age, of course, is to use search engines. And um, search engines sometimes work within academic uh, un university websites and so forth. but but not always, you know, uh, serious research is usually published in peer reviewed publications that may not be available to the public. Let's take a look at what we get when we try to use uh, various search engines. I've been doing this for years now. And if I enter terms like military plus climate impact, I always get lots of hits to the effect, oh, the Pentagon is very concerned or the uh, you know, military in other countries very concerned about climate change and we're working hard to uh, figure out how to deal with it. Uh, there is never any reference to the military's role in causing climate change. So, you know, maybe my search terms aren't that good. A search engine is a pretty blunt instrument. So I fooled around with things like, you know, a military plus climate change or climate impact. And for to prepare for this presentation, I started to put in NASA, the, uh, you know, U.S. space um, entity that, uh, you know, has climate impacts, what do we see when we uh, search for those things? Well, uh, we see that a NASA study is helping with the world food supply because they have been, um, you know, studying how climate change impacts. They, they're not studying how they impact climate change and thus impact the uh, world's food supply, but um, that's something that you have to kind of deconstruct it to figure out. I loved this quote from a U.S. official, John Conger, Again, uh, speaking to Defense One, the military publication Defense One, he said, the climate crisis is often described as two complementary challenges, managing the unavoidable and avoiding the unmanageable. The unavoidable includes the worsening conditions of the next 20 to 30 years already baked in if every nation on the globe drastically cuts emissions. You can almost see the Pentagon licking its chops here going, oh goody, climate chaos will bring so many more opportunities for us to bring security to the world. And um, it's very hard for people that are just kind of consuming mainstream media, corporate news, and not, uh, not the people on this webinar. Uh, it's often very difficult for them to kind of see past that communication strategy and look beneath and find out that the, um, you know, uh, the entity is actual a cause of the problem and not a solution as they like to present themselves. 
I tried NASA and emissions and got three uh, different examples of what a great uh, citizen NASA is in terms of climate. They've helped the Chicago airport reduce harmful carbon emissions with their technology. They've recorded China and India's sulfur emissions that are linked to millions of deaths. Again, we return to the vilifying of China as a possible next enemy for all this US military aggression. And also the Hubble telescope, who doesn't love these beautiful uh, nebulas and the photographs that we see of these uh, big star systems that came up because the word emission is in there. You know, takeaway, NASA is helping everybody as much as they can, looking for danger for us, trying to keep us out of trouble, and um, also bringing us uh, super beautiful photos that we wouldn't have had without their technology. Um, as has been mentioned, the drone wars um, that were so much in the news because of a horrible drone strike just at the end of the Afghan war that killed many civilians, including small children, um, and the Pentagon has now investigated itself and declared that nothing wrong was done. Um, those drone strikes um, often conducted from uh, Germany's Ramstein Air Base, or it's in Germany, it's a US Air Base, and controlled from the De Nevada desert. But this, none of this could happen without satellite communications. And of course, uh, satellite communications kind of link up the different remote players for um, this type of warfare. Um, I had occasion to hear uh, the Global Network's Dave Webb, who uh, got to go to the UK, uh, a radar station in uh, Great Britain, and talked to some Royal Air Force personnel that were working there. And they had chosen to work for the newly created Space Command. Um, and they uh, told Mr. Webb that they considered themselves space enthusiasts, and they had moved into this part of the Royal Air Force uh, motivated by you know, keeping up with this interest of theirs. And they said things like, it's an exciting arena. And um, I get to work with new technologies and um, you know, it's about exploration. Now, uh, since the last age of exploration resulted in widespread genocide and environmental degradation, you might think that the word explo exploration was no longer uh, something positive, but um, I think that space is very much portrayed as being this new avenue of exploration, and we know how well that went last time. An area for which there is more research in terms of space and climate is the ozone layer. Uh, ozone depletion is an area that um, there is more data on, and you can find some articles on this, but I noticed that almost all the information I found focused on private space um, rockets. So uh, again, NASA or the US military were pretty much ignored, even though their emissions, of course, contribute to um, uh, eroding the ozone layer as well. Billionaire space tourism has been a great distractor for the public because people either love or hate these uh, flamboyantly wealthy individuals that are going into space. But again, where is the reporting on the climate impacts of governmental space programs? You can see that um, the word billionaire will crop up in the same headline with pollution, but we don't see NASA's popping up in that connection. SpaceX in particular, which is the company uh, owned by Tesla founder Elon Musk, is an especially attractive target for uh, environmentalists. And besides emissions, which are uh, dealt with in this slide and really uh, kind of qu uh, quantified by a researcher Ian Whitaker, um, I know that SpaceX has also been heavily criticized for the environmental destruction around its launch sites in Texas. And um, so again, where have we heard similar criticisms of NASA shared in the corporate press? Uh, we have not. Maybe I just need to fix my search terms again. So I tried NASA environmental harm. And all the hits that came up first were actual NASA uh, sites, web, web pages. And um, you know we can see here that NASA is safeguarding our atmosphere rather than contributing to uh, warming. So it's, it's pretty consistent. And um, one of the, a parallel theme here is that not only are the military and militarized space victims of climate change and the changes that that will bring about, but also NASA is depicted here as the victim of space debris. So, you know, space debris, understanding the risks to NASA spacecraft um, is uh, the way that they're presenting that to the public. 
Um, is NASA a military program? Well, even before Space Force was created, uh, the technology that de developed by NASA has been an integral part of um, the Pentagon's plans for full spectrum dominance of the planet. And, um, but of course, the militarized nature of NASA was baked in from the beginning. Thousands of German rocket scientists founded NASA, and uh, the most famous of whom is probably the, the Nazi Werner von Braun. Um, I know as a retired school teacher that school children starting as young as age four or five are heavily propagandized uh, in US schools to admire NASA's people and its missions. Um, and identity politics come strongly into play in these communications. Uh, very, very much like military recruiting ads, you'll see a lot of images of BIPOC and women astronauts. And um, again, uh, you know, this is definitely pitched at children. And so that kind of look at this, don't ever look at all that out there, starts very early and um, it, it's effective. So that's why they do it. Um, even in English language reporting of international um, space uh, you know, activities, we see no mention of climate impacts at all, even when they're talking about security. Um, this is the English language press. I uh, only can read the English language press, so I would be very interested to hear from people in uh, other countries or other uh, languages about does your press do the same thing? Do your governmental agencies also, um, you know, portray this in the same way or is a little more truth leaking in there. Finally, what can we do? We all know there is no planet B. It's this one and we all love it and we want to live here and we want our children and grandchildren to be able to live here. Um, the indigenous people that have uh, not contributed mightily to climate chaos want to live here and they want their children and grandchildren to live here. So what can we do? I think some of us have the skills to study the greenhouse gas emissions of all space programs. And are the scientists that are able to do that, will they struggle to find funding to do that? Uh, maybe, probably. Um, but without that data, it's very hard for us to make rational decisions about what we can afford and what we can not afford in terms of emissions in the future. Then most of us here on this call can report and share the findings of those studies and the um, you know, the, the, the sort of ecological community of information sharing is extremely important. Uh, social media platforms are used, all webinars like this one, uh, email, lots of other ways to get the word out. So um, we're all trying to help with that part of the job. And we can also challenge that kind of rah, rah, you know, reporting on space programs that completely ignores climate impacts. I spend a ridiculous amount of time leaving comments on articles, just pointing out in a polite tone of voice, that, you know, what was left out of the article. And I think that, um, you know, we can all consider doing that kind of work. Finally, I would like to say that, um, you know, the space industrial complex is always going to be portrayed positively in the US as a jobs program. I suspect the same is true in many other uh, countries. But if we were to convert that kind of um, industrial capacity to building things that mitigate the effects of climate change rather than contributing to them, uh, economist studies show you very likely would create even more uh, good full-time jobs with benefits than you are creating doing the highly uh, technical and militarized building that is so much of the U.S. economy in every location. So I thank you very much for listening to me and uh, for being here today, and I look forward to your questions.